Everyone, we're just waiting a minute or two um, for some other people to join and then we will get started. Jessica, if you want to go ahead, I'm in the car, so I'm here, but I'm in the car. Okay. All right. Um, great. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we're wrapping up the year, so we have our task force today, and then we will have another task force meeting next Tuesday at 3 o'clock, um, and, uh, and that'll probably be it, because I don't know if anyone will be on between Christmas and New Year's. So, uh, so I think we're on our last two. Um, and um, for a little preview, which we usually don't do, but next week we're gonna be focusing on employment and sort of the, uh, the, the scene around jobs and workforce and, 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 and that issue. So we hope people will join us then. Um, but so today uh, we really wanted to focus on health and um, we have been very lucky that our friends at the health department and the vaccine command center um, join us frequently and keep us updated. And um, we really want to thank um, Chelsea for continuing to, to be here and to, and to bring us information and answer questions. And today, um, in addition to bringing us updates, Chelsea has um, also brought um, her colleague from the Department of Health, Dr. Quinn, um, to talk about um, transmission and other sort of medical issues. So um, if we want to just sort of take it away, this, you want to, we want to start with Dr. Quinn or Chelsea? Yeah, you want to... I'll, I'll take it off. Right. Um, thank you so much for having us. And thank you, uh, Pro President Jessica, everyone to, for entertaining us for now. It's been almost a, almost a year, I want to say, um, on, on these meetings um, and letting us kind of share all of the public health uh, uh, knowledge that we've been able to share with you all. Um, yeah. I will give a very quick topper and then introduce uh, Dr. Celia Quinn, uh, who is our Deputy Commissioner um, for Disease Control here at the department, our incident commander for the COVID-19 response. Um, and she can tell you a little bit more about what's going on. I thought we'd do a quick transmission update of what's happening in the city with COVID cases. I think folks have probably seen on the news um, that we are in uh, significantly increased transmission right now. Um, and then you know, talk a little bit about what we do and don't know about Omicron. Um, holiday guidance of how to stay, you know, safe this holiday season, um, and then uh, vaccines, boosters, everything you want to know, um, and then we can answer questions. And if that sounds good with you, I will uh, pass it over to Dr. Quinn. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Quinn. My pleasure. Yes, thank you for inviting us. And um, I'll just echo all the things that Chelsea said about um, you, your efforts in the task force and our partnership from the health department side. Um, so yes, I think um, it won't be a surprise to all of you that um, our COVID case numbers have been going up. Um, they've really been increasing since the beginning of November um, and then increasing more dramatically since right after Thanksgiving um, and continuing through like this past current week. Um, I think um, what's important to know is that the majority, 95% or more of these um, cases, we think are Delta, um, the same um, variant that caused the surge that occurred in August and September. Um, and although we do have Omicron circulating in New York City right now, that's still a small proportion of our cases. But given what is happening in Europe, I would expect that that proportion is going to increase dramatically um, over the next several weeks. Um, although it is a little bit hard to predict what the timing of that will be. Um, I also wanted to mention that, you know, we have seen hospitalizations increasing, although slowly, um, since we, you know, around the middle of November, and we do expect to see hospitalizations increase after we start to see cases increase, just because of the length of time it takes between when someone gets exposed to be infected and then um, to become severely ill and hospitalized. 
Um, we're still having very low um, levels of deaths, around 10, 11 deaths per day. Um, those, it's a little hard to tell what the pattern is with that. I think that I would expect if hospitalizations continue to increase, we would later in a few weeks start to see deaths increase also, unfortunately. One thing that's definitely important for everybody to be aware of, and this is, I think, really well done on our website, is that the rate of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are increasing very much more dramatically in people who are not vaccinated. Um, people who are vaccinated are still having relatively low levels of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Um, so it's really important to continue to encourage people to become vaccinated. We do have over... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, really fast. Dr. Quinn, I'm going to drop into the chat. I've shared this before, but I'm going to drop in the, that graphic that a lot of folks really like, which basically shows unvaccinated cases. All the cases are going up, but unvaccinated case rates versus vaccinated case rates and a really big gap between the two. I think it's very compelling when folks are, you know, a little on the fence and you want to show them really how impactful vaccines are. It shows you everything you need to know. Sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so what was the next thing I was going to say about it? Um, the um, Sorry, I interrupted you. I think you were going to talk have... maybe about Delta. Um, no, I was going to say that the um, vaccinated, unvaccinated, I guess. Oh, I was going to say that um, we do have 70% of all New York City residents fully vaccinated at this point, which is terrific. That's unbelievable progress in just one year of vaccination. Um, however, given the rate of increase in cases that we're seeing and how vulnerable we know that people are who have not been infected before, have not been, sorry, vaccinated previously, it's really important to continue to push those numbers up. We have, um, again, slower increase of vaccination among younger age groups that um, five to 17 age group. Um, and so again, um, just the uh, little pockets of groups of people in New York City who are unvaccinated are really contributing to the increase in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that we expect to see. Um, I know there's been a lot of news about the new variant, Omicron, so I'll just touch on a few things that we do and don't know about this variant. Um, it came to attention just a few weeks ago, um, having been identified at first in um, some countries in Africa, probably emerged early in November in those countries has a lot of mutations of the spike protein, which is concerning to epidemiologists, suggests that it might uh, be able to evade immunity, meaning that if you were previously infected or vaccinated, your immune system might not be as good at fighting off an infection with this virus. And it does seem to be, as more data emerges, that that is the case, um, that people who are exposed to Omicron might be more likely to be reinfected if they had a previous COVID infection, um, that if they're vaccinated, they might be more likely to have a breakthrough infection. It seems like some of those breakthrough infections are more mild illness, but it's very early yet in our experience with this variant to know that for sure. And as it um, you know, starts to expose more people who are more highly susceptible, we may see a change in the pattern of what kind of severity we see. So I'm you know, very concerned that we you know, not be too reassured by some of the data that's starting to emerge about the severity of illness. Um, the, the emerging news that is somewhat hopeful is that um, it does appear that in laboratory studies, um, a booster dose of vaccine can really help to um, address some of that, um, you know, evasion of immunity um, that this variant may have. Um, so uh, I think the health department has been recommending this for a while, but we're really strongly recommending that everyone who is eligible for a booster of their COVID vaccine get a booster as soon as possible. Um, that will really help us as we go into the winter months with the increase in both Delta cases that we're seeing as well as, um, you know, this threat of this emerging variant that is now circulating here as well. I think those were all the things I wanted to mention. Chelsea will tell me if I forgot anything. No, I think, I think that's great. I think we are, you know, in terms of you all are amazing messengers and leaders in this space and have been so helpful in getting these messages out. I think I'll drop some more links for like holiday guidance and other things in the in the chat, but I really think right now in this moment in time, um, having people acknowledge what a significant increase we're seeing um, and why it is so, so, so necessary to take these precautions at this time, even though I know people are totally over it and they don't want to spend another Christmas in masks. Um, unfortunately, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I think we were at under a thousand cases per day and now we're at over 2,400 per day. So I really think it is, um, 
so imperative that particularly ahead of the holidays, we are boosting if vaccinated, getting first dose or second dose if you don't have it already, masking, testing before and after, um, and you know, continuing these precautions that we know work because we are very much not out of it yet. Um, but yeah, I think we can answer any questions if anyone has them. At this point, y'all are so well versed in this. You're like health department deputies a lot of the time on, on speaking uh, to your own communities, but we want to arm you with the right talking points and any other resources you need. Um, sorry, and really quickly, I see your hand, Amy. I will very quickly, sorry, go over, I for, completely forgot this part, the mandates, the recent mandates announced. So I just want to do a quick rundown of kind of what is where and when and how. Um, I think, you know, most recently, I'll go through kind of what's in place and what's to come. So what's in place already, what is already effect, in effect, key to NYC, um, uh, city workforce mandate, extracurricular activities um, for kids at DOE and charter schools, um, and staff, of course, for yeah, DOE and charter schools, um, healthcare workers, those have all been in place for some time. The new expansion has now increase the age or decrease the age for key to NYC to include five plus. Um, so that took effect to today, actually it's the 14th, so today. Um, extracurricular activities for five plus is now also been expanded, that requirement for DOE and charters also today. Um, child care workers takes effect on the 20th of December. Um, Non-public school staff also takes effect on the 20th of December. Um, key to NYC expansion to two doses or fully vaccinated, not just, sorry, two doses. Um, that is the 27th. The private sector employee mandate takes effect on the 27th that they have to have one dose um, by the 27th. And there's more um, detail, detail and information will be released on that um, tomorrow, so the 15th. Um, and then the governor's newest announcement, um, uh, mask or vax mandate, basically that's how we're referring to it. Um, but uh, last, maybe just on Friday, um, and on Monday it took effect, the governor put in place this mask or vaccine requirement where masks must be worn um, in all indoor, indoor public places unless businesses or, or um, spaces uh, implement a vaccine requirement. There's an FAQ, I'll drop that into the chat, that basically also calls out key to NYC and how it overlaps um, and, and integrates with our own policy here in the city. And the biggest question I've been asked about this is addressed in the FAQ. This does apply to residential building common spaces. So I know that that's something a lot of you have been very concerned about and have gotten a lot of incoming on. It does not apply to residential, obviously private residences, um, but it is called out very clearly in the FAQ that it is intended to apply to uh, common spaces in residential buildings. Okay, sorry, that was a long rundown and it is a lot of information. We're here for questions. Amy, I saw your hand up, go first. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm from the arts sector and I will let the people know that um, there are organizations that have made the decision in the past week because of increased transmission to actually cancel what we're going to be in-person holiday parties. So that's going on and obviously our sector is very um, affected, but I'm actually asking this question as a public school parent, um, which is that it's very unclear it doesn't seem like there's a clear standard for testing and when there will be shut down of public schools on the basis of um, disease that's detected within the school. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that and speak to there being greater clarity. My memory is at the beginning of the school year, the, uh, the standard was that if there are four or more unrelated cases, but now my understanding is that's not it. And I'm particularly worried about that as Omicron um, is going to continue to emerge. Um, that we don't seem to have a clear policy unless you're going to tell me we do or we're thinking about changing things. Um, and I also was querying, given that Omicron seems to be affecting fully vaccinated, although maybe not boosted folks, um, and most students are not going to yet, you know, be at the point where they would get a booster, um, why the limitation is only to test at the moment students that are unvaccinated. Thank you so much. 
Yeah. So I, I mean, I will start. I think our priority has been to keep kids in school safely. I'm also a public school parent and I agree that sometimes it is confusing <laughs> what's happening. Um, but I, you know, I, again, our, our high priority from the city perspective is to try to keep as many kids in school as possible. And based on our experience from last year and our um, work with T2 DOE and the situation room, um, we have, uh, you know, we've been able to really keep a lot of children in school. I think I'll ask T2 to come comment a little bit more on the details of um, how that works, but essentially we're trying to identify the children who have had a real exposure that's likely to, or more likely to result in an infection. Um, and so I'll let Laura comment on that, but I did just want to also mention, you know, um, following CDC's guidance, if people who have been vaccinated have a known exposure, they're encouraged to get tested between three to five days after that exposure, but they don't need to quarantine during those three days. Hey everyone, and sorry, I am a little bit under the weather today, so not in my normal perky uh, orientation. Um, a couple of things I will say about school testing. First of all, the surveillance testing that we are doing in schools, and I've dropped the portal into the chat here. Uh, a few things about it. The goal of surveillance testing, and it's really important to stress this because I think it gets lost a lot in the conversation, is to determine whether there is transmission occurring within school buildings. That is the critical question that surveillance testing is trying to answer. It is not diagnostic testing. Diagnostic testing is asking if somebody is symptomatic or has been a close exposure, <clears throat> do they have, are they positive for COVID? So two different questions. Um, in terms of the way the program is structured right now, it follows the CDC guidance which is to have 10% of the school tested unvaccinated, the unvaccinated population. Why you may ask? Because that is the most vulnerable part of the school. Um, we actually did expand a little bit out to uh, teachers and adults in the building. They are all now under the vaccine mandate, but if they know that the surveillance testing team is coming, they can put in a request through the school to get courtesy testing. That does not count toward the 10% surveillance testing. I wanna be very clear about that. Why, why does that matter? Because what we are doing there is saying, okay, because we happen to be here, we can give you a, a test, but you're not actually part of kind of the way we're calculating whether there is transmission occurring in the schools. Now, also really important to say that the vast, vast, vast majority, when I say the vast majority, I mean like, 99.5% of the cases we see have nothing to do with school-based transmission. In fact, when kids were home, uh, when we were doing blended learning and we were doing remote learning, uh, what we saw is that kids were much safer in school buildings than they were in their homes. Why? Because they're spending you know, eight or 10 hours a day in a very controlled environment. They were wearing masks, uh, there's ventilation protocols. Whereas at home, we know that most transmission where people can identify the source of infection, it is occurring within people's own households. So I think it's really important to keep all of those things in mind. Um, that said, the 10% threshold, again, this is CDC guidance. It's for the unvaccinated. Uh, obviously it's an opt-in. We continue, we continue to urge people who are unvaccinated to consent to having uh, students back, uh, join the surveillance testing program. They can always sign the consent form. There is no closing date on it as far as I'm aware. Um, but so a couple of things also to say about the portal that I think are important. The portal is extremely uh, forthcoming about all of the different details in terms of testing the different student bodies. It'll tell you how many schools we went to every week, how many tests were conducted. You can look up each particular school, in fact, and you can see exactly how many tests were done. You can see how many positives there were. And what you'll see is that by and large, you're not, there's not going to be uh, a lot of positives associated with this surveillance testing. And again, if there is, it doesn't mean that there is transmission occurring in the school. So once we get a positive through the surveillance program, and I think also important to say that obviously there's two ways to get positive cases or to identify positive cases. One is through surveillance and one is through diagnostics. So, in the surveillance program, that's not based on whether somebody has symptoms. It's based on whether they've consented and they're unvaccinated. The diagnostic program is obviously, obviously going to be a lot more skewed toward positive cases because that's people who are more likely to test positive. They're symptomatic or they were near somebody who, you know, tested positive recently. So 
again, two different ways that we get cases. When a surveillance test comes back positive, it goes to the situation room, the situation room alerts the school, the school then begins to do work in partnership with the situation room to determine who was a contact, determine if the classroom needs to quarantine, and eventually uh, if perhaps the school needs to close. That's kind of the tool of last resort. This year, we have had, I think, five closures in total. It's either three or five. So somebody's going to have to correct me on that one. Um, last year, we saw a lot more closures for a number of reasons. One, there was no vaccine at all. <laughs> um, I think that's a really critical piece here. Um, two, we were also, we had a, a little bit of a different standard, which was following a different CDC and Department of Health standard as well, or State Department of Health, I should say. So really important to keep all of those things in mind. Um, additionally, you can look online and you can see, I will pull it up. There is a map that we publish every day that shows where all of the COVID cases in schools are located. Um, so why is this helpful and interesting? Well, a couple of things. One, I think it's important to say that just because we find, let's say, two cases of COVID in a school building does not mean that there is transmission in the school building. I think this is a critical piece. Like the example we always use is if two people have contracted COVID and they walk onto a subway car, it doesn't mean they contracted sub COVID in the subway car. It means that they both happen to be uh, infected when they walked into the same place. So a lot of the work that we're doing through the sit room and through test and trace is trying to determine where the cases contracted within the school itself is their transmission at the school base level. And that's what generates a school closure, uh, that kind of determination. And so it's not sort of as cut and dry as if there are this many cases, there is a closure. At one point, that was the way that we had structured this, right? Last year, that was definitely the case. I think if there were three uh, cases in grades that were not the same, then we determined that there was transmission in the schools. Again, this is all pre-vaccine. Um, this is a sort of an entirely different atmosphere. Um, so I would just refer people to those resources. I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but I hope that gives you more kind of context about how decisions are made. Great. Um, thank you, Laura. I think that is that is really helpful. Um, we have a few questions. Um, Ushma, I think you had your hand up first. Thank you. Um, I appreciated uh, the information. I'm also coming to you as a public school parent and a public school parent who is Gail's um, uh, appointee to CEC D2. And we have a meeting tonight. I'd encourage any parents to please come and speak out against one of the stupidest resolutions I've ever seen my coworkers put up that um, is asking for us to move to mask optional for our children. Um, so this question is actually directed at you, uh, Dr. Quinn, which is, I've been fighting against this, showing people data about transmission and the increase in transmission, the increase in travel that's upcoming, et cetera, and trying to table this until the spring. Um, but they're saying that there are no studies that show that masks work in children. Um, I'm looking through the literature and trying to find this and wondering if you or uh, Laura or Chelsea have any particular literature that you have cited in the past um, that has been useful for showing, because I know that there's confounding variables here. You can't separate just mask use from social distancing as, whether, as well as other mitigation practices. They're talking about how this is reducing social emotional learning. And while I can be understanding about some of these things, the alternatives are worse. They're also talking about how the case rates within children are not as severe, et cetera. So what I'm looking for is just a couple of additional talking points. I'm a scientist myself and I'm trying here, but it's hard to deal with crazy. I think you mm -hmm. all probably deal with that much more frequently. So I'd love to be able to learn from you what some of the things have been that you've used in the past. And, or if anyone wants to come to the CECD2 meeting tonight, I will put the link into the chat, come and talk um, with your expertise about this. Sure. Um, so yes, masks work. They definitely work for um, decreasing spread in um, a lot of different settings. I will think about if there's a particular paper that like specifically answers that question. Um, I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit, but I feel like CDC has a few um, 
papers that came out over the summer just related to school, which definitely has to do with children. Um, and just the, the need for the layered mitigation that works to reduce transmission in school, I think that's pretty well established at this point. Um, so masking in addition to a number of other um, factors really been important. Um, I, I think we'll be able to get you some um, epi studies that would be supportive of that. Well, um, I dropped a link yeah. to a paper that uh, had been written by Dr. Varma, amongst other people, including Tess and Trace and the Department of Health, that reflected on reopening of schools last year. Again, this is all pre-vaccine, describing sort of how much safer the school environment actually was as compared to remote learning. And I think if you look through the paper, you'll see um, sort of the arguments laid out there. But amongst them is that obviously people were not masking at home. Um, you know, kind of, yes, it's a part of the whole multi-layered approach, right? It's ventilation, it's social distancing, it's masking, but certainly that is a key part of this. Great, thank you. Um, great, uh, Val? Um, Dr. Quinn, can you put your contact information in the chat? And let me just say, I think my question is a little unfair, but I'm going to raise it. Um, one of my issues is the fact that I think that the departments need to work together. So last week we had a presentation on open restaurants. And uh, one of the things people kept saying was the fact that quite a few of these restaurants that's in the street are not really outdoors. There's no ventilation. They're like totally enclosed. And um, it was basically DOT. But the issue becomes if we are doing open restaurants for a health reason, the health department should also be involved. And one of the things that the CDC says is that they should consider leaving one or more sides open when you have these structures out there. And so that's my question is, are you talking with say DOT about open restaurants? Because I think that like last week, I think people were well informed. But there's a lot of people that I don't think are well informed and go to these uh, out, indoor, outdoor sites like they're safe and they look like serious bubbles of in, infection. And so, you know, I think that it's important not just for DOT to be talking about open restaurants, especially if they're health oriented, but for the health department to be talking with them. So that, I mean, when I went on their website, they have all kinds of things about how much space you should have out there and all of this, but it really wasn't a lot about making sure that there's ventilation. And I didn't see anything similar to the uh, CDC's thing about, you know, tents and sidewalks and consider leaving one side open. So that, that's somewhat my question, are, are you talking? Because I've, I've heard at some other meetings we, uh, the agencies talk about how they don't talk to one another. And so I just think it's very important to talk about this because I think there are people that go to these indoor, outdoor structures thinking that they're safe and, and they really strike me as not. Yeah, thank you for raising that. I'm um, so first of all, the best way to get in touch with me is through Chelsea. She has a much better track record of getting me to answer emails. And um, I think the other thing is, yes, we're definitely talking to a lot of our um, different agencies about all of these different policies right now. Um, I think Chelsea's probably in a better position to answer specifically um, the one side open thing. I know that that is part of the requirement for being considered an outdoor dining establishment in New York City. Oh, okay. Cause I, I didn't yeah. see that when I looked. Okay. I do. I mean, I'm trying to look at the regulations now just to answer your initial question. Yes. We talked to DOT all the time. Um, we were very, very, very intimately involved. And in, when the program initially rolled out, we did lots of town halls with DOT and nightlife and SBS to educate people about the ever evolving changing regulatory scheme, including that with the state, because they also had their own regulations on outdoor dining for when reopening first started. Um, I do believe that there is a requirement for at least one open side, but I'm trying to find it right now and am very bad at multitasking. So if I find it, I'll drop it in here. Um, but totally, hear you that people may perceive um, uh, 
no risk. I will, I'll take outdoor dining out of it just when they are outside generally. And obviously we know that there's lower risk when people are outdoors, but not no risk. And so um, I, I totally hear you. And I think that if there are instances where you're hearing about, um, you know, people uh, having issues between agencies or anything like that, you can always come to me. Um, but I think I do believe that was a requirement of the outdoor dining structure. I'm just trying to find it now. So while I'm not talking, I will yeah. find it. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. Because uh, I can, I, your information is in the chat and I can just contact you um, to find that out. Cause I couldn't find it. I was looking forward to, thank you. And I would just add, I mean, I, I, I agree with Tulsi. I do think that it's a requirement, but I also think that, you know, there's the emergency open restaurant program, but then there's the permanent one that they're working on. So I think people really need to weigh in at these round tables and surveys and all the stuff yeah. that DLT is doing to make sure that they hear our voices on that. Cause it is really, it's really important. Um, Shula, you have a question? Did you? Actually, I really the same um, question as Val, and I think not only looking forward, and Chelsea, I think you totally address this, but I think also in the sense that the, I forget what's called exactly, the, the future program, <laughs> the more permanent program um, is, you know, at least some time away from now. I think there are more questions right now as people, you know, do want to still go to their restaurants and, and support them, and they do want to get together, but um, there's, and then for neighborhoods, it seems like that's the real minority in terms of places that are actually um, open. Um, and some of them have maybe like a little door or window that opens. But I think, um, right. you know, what should we be telling people from, from a health perspective? Is it just that those are places that are skirting the rules and, you know, and it's not getting enforced? Or, or are those places following the rules? And I, I think we're all cognizant, right, is that people don't want to feel like they're telling on, you know, local businesses, but at the same time, you know, everyone wants us all to be safe in the community. So I think just how to navigate that, if you just give it from a health perspective, you know, what should people be thoughtful about? Yeah, I'm happy to, and I think Dr. Kim may have just had to get pulled off. So we may um, have her back, but I, we may have lost her, not permanently, but for today. Um, I I think in terms of kind of what I was just saying that I think that there is a, a, to, a false sense of in, entire security when people enter the outdoors, right? Like when they step right. outside, they think that risk has been neutralized entirely. And we know, you know, if you're in crowds, if you are still in indoor spaces, that there is obvi obviously a level of risk. All of our activities have risk in this type in this world. Um, I think that, you know, we've heard folks, if they are concerned about those structures, um, I, those complaints are going through 311. And I do believe that they're being routed to DOT. But I also, you know, I've heard anecdotally from friends of, of folks who have had a conversation with the restaurant themselves um, and said, right. you know, they really would love a window open in here or something like that. And that has actually gone a long way. And having those conversations with our business businesses who are also our neighbors and our friends and, you know, colleagues in a lot of cases um, have been pretty powerful um, and also help avoid that kind of like enforcement relationship. Um, but I do think that just being cognizant and if folks are going, uh, you know, out doing things, et cetera, et cetera, we are still encouraging masking when you're not eating and drinking. If you're indoors, you're indoors. And that means if you're not eating or drinking, put that mask on. Um, and I think that uh, encouraging testing when you're doing, you know, particularly large gatherings is something that we all just need to get accustomed to being part of our lives right now um, in this in this kind of surge time. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, any other questions anyone has? Um, I would just, you know, say um, in terms of the guidance for mask wearing, um, you know, I know that there's a sort of a list of places that you know, don't need to ask about vaccination. So you just have to wear a mask, right? Grocery stores, you know, other places like that, right? And then, you know, for outdoors, I think it's always a little confusing to people because it, it's like, you don't need to wear a mask outdoors unless you're in a crowd and sort of what's, does that mean you're in an event or just mean you're in a really crowded street and, you know, when you're crossing. And so I think there's some, uh, I've heard some people ask questions about that as well. Um, and I assume we're just encouraging people to wear masks whenever, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think the strong recommendation and like the advisory is specific to indoor settings. I think if you are, you know, a crowd obviously is subjective, but I think we know when we're in a crowd and like proximity to other people. And um, I think folks in New York more so than anywhere else I've I've been in the last year, people do get um, the value of masks. So um, I, although Ushma, good luck tonight. Um, that is that is disheartening to hear, um, but I suppose not unexpected. Okay, any other questions for Chelsea or Laura? I think Laura's still on. Anybody? And I, I do just wanna say we are getting a lot of questions about the, um, the private sector employee mandate and the non-public school mandate. We will have um, guidance up tomorrow uh, about the private sector um, employee mandate and then non-public schools guidance coming very soon, if not today, early tomorrow. Um, I know a lot of folks are getting a lot of questions about that. We wanna make sure you all feel equipped with um, how to handle them uh, uh, as this all of these mandates roll out. Um, but thank you again for being great partners and understanding the need for all of this. Terrific. Um, well, if there's no other questions, I do. I want to thank you again, um, Laura and Chelsea. You guys have been amazing. Come all the time. Your information's great, and we just we so appreciate it. It's just it's it's information we all need, and you know you you are very generous with your time. You present things so clearly. So you know. Just on behalf of the borough president, we really just thank you for, for participating for all you've uh, and for all you've given to this task force. Um, thank you all. And with, with, thank you. Sure. Um, and with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, like I said, we have one more task force, which will be next Tuesday. We're going to focus on employment and workforce, and we hope to see you all then. And meanwhile, everyone have a good week. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks.